welcome back everybody to another episode with your part-time controller. It's Nonprofit Power Week, and we are super excited to have Ariella Reese, manager with Your Part-Time Controller, joining us. Okay, no eye rolls, as we like to say in the nonprofit show, but Ariella, you're going to help us to enjoy budgeting? That's right, Julia. We're going to see what we can do to make the most out of the budgeting process and change our mindsets to make it a little bit more interesting and fun. Wow. Okay, well... Wendy, I know that you did not roll your eyes because you confessed to me that you love budgeting. I am embracing that. Yes, you are correct. I think that's great. Well, ladies, before we get started, we also want to embrace our amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. You know, we are... an so blessed to have these great co-hosts. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by Wendy F. Adams, CFRE of Cultivate for Good. Wendy, I am really excited that you are with me on today's episode because you've walked this walk, haven't you? I have indeed, and I am so excited to learn more and embrace the budget. I love it. Embrace the budget. Well, there's nothing better than that. Ariella Reese is coming to us as a manager from your part-time controller. Okay, my new friend, what does a manager do at YPTC? Because you got a lot to manage over there with almost 800 employees. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, we do a lot, but broadly speaking, uh, I oversee uh, engagements with a host of clients and I help our associates and other staff members get the resources that they need to uh, produce excellent uh, financial data and financial statements for our clients. Wow, amazing. And what part of the country are you coming to us from today? I am here in sunny Los Feliz, Los Angeles, California. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's get into it because this is a big, big topic. It, it absolutely is. And, and like we talked about, ladies, I am ready to embrace. So Ariella, budgeting for a surplus, is that a thing? Tell us, tell us. It certainly should be more of a thing, Wendy. Uh, the budget process is the moment, the one moment that you kind of have all year to dream big, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I know it's in the name, nonprofit, uh, but as it turns out, not even nonprofits need to bring in more money than they spend. So during that budget process, when you're planning your next year, it's so important to make a plan to come out with some savings, with some profit. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's so important to balance your optimism with reality, but when you enter into the budget process, you, you really wanna plan for a surplus. Um, it's that opportunity that you have uh, once a year to really plan to get yourself into a better place. So I really encourage organizations, don't waste it. We spend so much time in panic mode. Uh, you know, there's, not a, there's never enough money for everything. Um, and that is really, at the end of the day, a kind of a toxic mentality. And it's so important mm. to break out of it too many organizations really live kind of on on panic and that and that gets you into uh short-term thinking uh essential spending only and that leads to missed opportunities impulsive decision making competitive behavior fear of missing out you know mm -hmm. uh if you are planning for a surplus uh you are making plans uh to have savings for a rainy day you 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 can um you know, it gives you some wiggle room if things don't go quite as you expect. Uh, funding is security and security is safety. And the way to plan for sustainability is to plan for a surplus. Wow. Wow. <laughs> as Julia would say, hair on fire, for sure. sure. And the way that we, I hear margin, Ariella, like we talk about this in our life, in our space, and what we're doing in the sector. And you're just saying plan for margin. Amazing. Plan for margin, plan for margin. Now you do have to be realistic, but uh, when you're planning out your revenue goals, uh, you wanna use your stretch goals. 
Now, I'm not saying you should use your sort of big, hairy, audacious goals. You need to be realistic. You want to set achievable goals, but setting the expectation that you know you're going to to aim high is mm. is so mm. important. Uh, because if you don't make a plan to get to those big revenue numbers, how are you going to get there? Not happening. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. <laughs> Julia, do you have thoughts on this? Well, I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm challenged by this because I don't think this is something we hear. I think we yep. need to hear it, but we don't hear it. And I'm wondering, Ariella, if you could guide us to what, if, if we haven't done this before, what mm would be a percent to total in terms of a stretch goal like you know five three percent better five percent better what seven ten what i'm gonna go ahead and say uh ten percent better would be the place i would want to start you know ten percent over prior year um you know i think that uh Every, you know, the ideal situation is that every year you're learning a little bit about your funders, about the landscape, uh, and and making that room for yourself to um, to uh, to find a new avenue or to ask for a little bit more. Uh, let's say you have a repeat funder and you're reapplying for uh, for your next year. Um, you know that you have a track record with that funder. Ask for more money. Ask for twenty percent more. See what happens. What's the worst they're going to say? Well, we'll give you five. We'll give you ten. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't ask, you will never. Uh, you'll never know if that money is is out there. And the money is out there. Um, the uh, you know the the landscape of philanthropy. Um, as as our economy grows and changes, you know those those uh, very large foundations are making uh, good in returns on their investments. They have the money to bring uh, to your to your charities, and I just encourage everyone to to really ask for it. Um, so same with your earned revenue. Uh, take the lessons that you learn throughout the year on how to better deliver your services, how to how to uh, keep your costs down how to um, you know, expand your market share if you're in the earned revenue space uh, and, and really set that goal. You may not hit your 10%, but you never know. You, uh, you know, Big ideas can break open new doors for you. So give it a try. Wow. You know, we, not what I thought you would say. Right, Wendy? I interrupted you. No, I just, we, we talked, Ariella said optimism, but making sure we balance that with reality because we're educating, right? You're not just saying, throw that out there, see what sticks against the wall, but you're like, take a look, look at the landscape, make those decisions and do the invitation into more to your stakeholders. And I think that that is what I took away just in the first few moments. Yeah, really interesting. And I, I love actually um, starting our conversation because mm -hmm. it seems to me, and this is the next thing that we really wanna you know, talk to you about, is that this is a mindset shift that's going to be pretty earth shattering for a lot of folks. They won't be within your organization. They won't be used to this. So what does it mean to, to do deep listening and staff engagement, Ariella? Yeah. So during your budget process, um, you know, we talk about top down and bottom up budgeting, and it's really ideal to have at least some level of staff engagement on that bottom up side. Of course, you know, your finance staff is going to kind of need to set the parameters mm -hmm. uh, of what is and isn't possible, you know, things that you're, you're not that your programmatic staff may not know. Uh, but you really want to involve all of all, you know, as many staff members as is practical for your situation. And it's a chance to really make them feel like they are the subject matter experts. OK, so, you know, those are your boots on the ground. Your programmatic people mm -hmm. are out there. Um, you know, they they know what the landscape looks like. Um, and doing that deep listening, hearing what they're telling you, making them feel like subject matter experts, if nothing else, it's an opportunity to mentor your staff members and, you know, make them feel like valued experts. That makes people look forward to budget season when they know that, you know, that's their opportunity to, to share their knowledge, to share what they've learned, to be listened to, to have someone really hear what they're saying about their jobs. 
they're going to look forward to doing that every year. And if you set that expectation yeah. uh, and you're encouraging your staff to learn and grow in their role, in their area, um, it's going to help everything, everywhere. Um, you have a lot of information that you can get from your staff members. Um, I, I want to, I always try to encourage people to get information on uh, the timing, not, not just, you know, how much money do we think we're going to make, but when throughout the year mm. are we going to make that money, right? Um, an allocated budget is so much more useful than a single one-year budget. So that's going to help with your budget to actual. That's going to help with your forecast. Um, it's going to help with your, your overall planning if you know that you have better opportunities at a particular time of year. Um, you know, so while you're doing that deep listening with your staff members, don't miss out on all this tangential information about revenue and expenses, timing, restrictions, find out, you know, during the budget process, you should be listening and, and, and finding out what about your restricted revenue, what's restricted and unrestricted, uh, and helping, uh, you know, your staff to, to set, shift their mindset to long-term sustainability, get that information from them during the budget process on what the five-year outlook looks like. Right. Right. Make that budget process um, a really holistic learning experience for everyone in the organization. So Ariel, I've got to ask this question because if, if you're working with an organization where the team has not been engaged in this level, What's a good place to start? Because if they haven't ever been a part of this process, how are they going to understand what needs to be done? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, well, with bottom-up budgeting, uh, we know that uh, you know the place that you're going to start is usually you're going to look at last year's finances, break it up by department and then bring that to your uh, department staff and say, okay, here's what we did last year. What do you think about, about next year? Sit down and go line by line and just say, you know, what do we think we can do here? It really is just a matter of giving your staff some information and asking them for their thoughts. In that first year, it you know, you might be met with blank stares, right? You, they might not be ready for that. Uh, but that's okay, right? This is a process. Uh, you know, we want to think long term. So you might not uh, get all the information that you're looking for in that first time around, but you're setting new patterns, you're setting new expectations. Um, you know, these things take a few tries, you know, any, any, any business process takes a couple of tries before you're going to get it just right. But if you don't get started, you're never going to get there. So it's going to look different in any organization, but just start asking those questions. I am loving what I'm hearing. And what I'm hearing is mentorship, building those relationships. We talk about that externally, but internally now they're empowered. And, and, and now it's not just numbers on a, on a spreadsheet for, for those who are on the front line. So, so Julia said, you know, how do you get them started? Now we're in the process. How do we actually know when it's good enough to move on, so, right? To go ahead and get towards that space of approving the budget, or like I say, like to say, get mo good enough to move on. I I love that get mo. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. I think. Okay, so. This is where uh, the top down comes in. It's really uh, in the hands of your chief financial officer and your, your uh, executive director to have that sense of, okay, um, you know, in, sorry, on some level it's intuitive, but on another level, it really is just the numbers. Um, is this within range of what we did last year and what we know about this year? Um, is this meeting our sort of intuitive expectations about where we thought we would land? Have we actually budgeted for a surplus? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and and what? How much time do you have left in the process? Um, and if you are sort of at the end of the time you have available, you are within striking distance of. Uh, you know, your numbers from last year and sort of the general expectation for the increase uh, in the current year, 
go ahead and stop. Go ahead and stop. Send it off to the board, get another set of eyes on it. Uh, you know, have your treasurer or your other, um, you know, your other parties on your board that, you know, that are good with budgets, have them take a look. If everyone's on board, go ahead and ask for the vote. Wow. I, I, I'm like, again, somewhat, somewhat shocked because I don't think that this is a normal trajectory. It just seems like that's why people oftentimes are discouraged or they, can't stand the budgeting process because it just seems to go on and on and on. And then I've got to ask you this question. It almost seems like you manufacture disengagement because people oh. are just like, I'm done. And it's easier to disengage, right? Versus yeah. to work it. And so I'm fascinated by this. Yeah. Um, you know, I tell staff all the time, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We have so much going on, uh, you know, in every area of a dynamic organization. Um, it's really easy. We're all, you know, high achieving go-getters. We want the best for our organization. We want the best for the people that we're serving. And it's, it's really easy to keep saying, I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. And that may be true given all the resources in the world, but at the end of the day, this is where that, you know, reality comes in to sort of temper your optimism. And you want to say, okay, I have a really good plan. And it's, don't forget, it's not the plan that, don't mistake the map for the destination. Have you ever heard that phrase? I heard this mm -hmm. recently, I think it's so fantastic, right? Your budget is just your plan. That do, That's not the actual numbers. Save the energy for doing more, better, faster for your actuals, for your actual mm -hmm. performance, right? Mm -hmm. Set your targets uh and and go for it and and get out out there and 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 you know go get that money because so we then, know the course correct is going to come <laughs> yes yeah. Indeed. yeah and so before we get on to that um this is like maybe a, a kind of a dorky question but how do we keep our staff knowing that we didn't just do the budget that we're actually as part mm -hmm. of the process do we have a budget meeting every month and we report out or because it seems to me that a lot of work goes into this process and then it doesn't circle back around until like the end of the year and it kind of becomes punitive if you didn't if you didn't align and so i'm wondering how we make it more realistic and functioning throughout the year yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of sharing um, information um, widely with staff. It's not always totally realistic. It really depends on the level of sophistication that your uh, team has for reading financial statements and for understanding kind of what goes into to every process. But to the extent possible, if you can share uh, performance information with staff members, uh, it really helps people to feel invested and involved in what's going on. If they can see things happening in real time, they can do something about it. You know, if you're talking to them about, you know, why a given expense um, impacts your your overall totals or, and you're, you know, maybe you're just, maybe you're not giving hard numbers, but you're giving, you know, percentages and margins and, you know, general ideas so that you're not, um, it is it's true that you can engage people too much and then you start devolving into conversations about specifics that may not really be um productive or in their wheelhouse or uh so you do want to of course avoid some of that uh but sharing a little bit of you know incremental information um some people thrive on on information uh, so it's, I think it's to some extent about understanding who your audience is in the mm -hmm. same way that you need to understand, you know, what your board thrives on to help them make decisions. The same principles apply to your staff member, at, to your staff members and the people working with you. And I really think that, you know, the finance department has an opportunity uh, to bring knowledge to mm -hmm. non-finance people about how to read financial statements. And even if that's not directly related to their job, it's such a good mentorship opportunity for people just yeah. in general. 
Um, so to the extent that you can take five minutes once a month to explain how something works, um, I think is really valuable. It, it makes people feel like they're getting a lot out of their workplace, um, that they under, that you're bringing them to a place where they can understand more about the world around them. And I know that's a bit, uh, a bit too feel more philosophical than we usually get in the accounting department, but I really feel strongly. Yeah. No, it, it's speaking into like I'm trying to stay in my seat on this because I've experienced both sides of it. One where I'm like, I just get to the end, and like you said, Julia, now you're just in trouble, hand slapped. And then there's the we're going to look at this monthly after our six hour budget meeting that we had to know where we are each and every point. And I had a controller at that point who said. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to bring this to you in such a way that you are now empowered to be able to read it. I felt like I walked away with an accounting minor at the end, but felt so much stronger in my holistic job at that point. So I couldn't agree more. Finances are really scary for people who don't understand what they're looking at. And when you bring knowledge, you bring comfort and oh, that yeah. makes people feel secure. And it, and it, you know, it, it it's not just a feeling, it's a reality. You know, when people understand what they're looking at, um, they can do better in their jobs. They move up, um, you know, their career path. Um, and, and it, you know, the rising tide raises all ships and uh, why not? <laughs> yeah. Why not bring that education to the people you're surrounded by? I mean, um, you know, we've worked for decades to to gain this knowledge and, you know, to be able to share it with people is a joy. Yeah, it's really important. Well, we don't have a lot of time left over and I want to get into this concept of making changes. Mm. What happens if we have to do something differently? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of scenarios in which you might uh, need to pivot. Um, you know, the best case scenario is you get some kind of windfall and you're able to execute on a whole new project, right? That's what we're hoping for. Uh, but it might not have been in your budget. So uh, I really encourage organizations, don't change the budget that got approved, right? The next budget season is going to be here before you know it. Mm-hmm. If you have a big new project that you want to do, create a separate standalone budget for that project and then mm. track your actuals against that. And then in the following year, you can merge all that together. Um, so, uh, you know, otherwise it gets really confusing when you're tracking budget to actuals because you're saying, oh, I thought we were this far ahead mm. last month and then suddenly everything changed and it's very confusing. So, um, uh, then on the flip side of that coin, uh, you know, we've seen recently with COVID, you know, what happens if everything has to sort of grind to a halt, if your operations are stopped or really significantly changed, that's a scenario uh, in which you might actually need to go ahead and say, okay, well, what we expected is not anything like what's going to happen. So that's really the only scenario in which I would say, scrap your old budget and go ahead and, and throw together, uh, throw together a new one because, uh, plans have really, really changed, stopped, or you're headed in a completely different trajectory. Yeah. Well, and it seems to me that you, that's where documentation and disclosure comes in so that you mitigate or explain as you use the word educate folks as to what were the conditions leading up to some of these, these pivot points. And um, really that's the magic in understanding how a budget works, I think, as opposed to just saying, oh, it didn't work, throw the whole thing out. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Even when you switch gears completely, you're you're still going to be using the information that you had from the original process. And um, it's it's a it's generally going to be a pivot and and not not a wholesale scrapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Wendy, do you think that your leadership and the trajectory of your career would have been changed if you had had this information and mindset? Oh, absolutely. Like I, like I talked about earlier, it was night and day from two different organizations where we didn't have and everyone dreaded. And you didn't, you just felt like someone handed you this information and said, go do it. It, it didn't even 
align with what you were doing day in and day out, right? Yeah. And now go do it and do it better. And so, yeah, compare that to I'm a part of the process. I love the the bottom up, right? Like that they're speaking into because they're they're working with the people that we're called to serve. They're the ones honestly are most connected with the why of what we're doing. And that's what the budget needs to reflect. So game changing. Yeah. Ariella, really interesting. Um, it seems to me, and again, we don't have a lot of time left, but it, it seems to me that this is that tone at the top kind of, mm. and we hear that a lot in accounting. How do we get our leadership to embrace this concept? Because at the end of the day, and I'm just going to call it out, I feel like a lot of times the finance department and their information is considered secretive. Absolutely. And I think that um, that's that can be a real problem. Uh, of course, there is a lot of private information uh, that we you know, that we handle in, in the finance and accounting world, payroll, for example, you can't share pay, you can't really share direct payroll information, um, obviously, but you can start sharing broader information. You can start, you can share, I, I think, you know, in terms of changing the tone at the top, it really does start with opening up the idea that it's okay to share in, share some information with the people who are on your team. Fostering that sort of we're in it together uh, mentality starts with sharing information with each other. It doesn't have to be super specific. You can talk in generalities, you can talk in percentages, you can talk in, you know, year over year uh, amounts uh, to sort of uh, obscure some of the more private information, but understand what's actually private and what's really not, you know, not everything. Uh, so much information gets published at the end of the year on your 990 anyway. Why not share some of that progress information throughout the year when you know it's publicly available anyway? Well, that's what I was going to jump in and say. You don't want your stakeholders knowing more than your internal staff because they've studied that 990 so intently. And I've walked into a supporter having it on his big screen TV. Let's walk through this 990. I better have a good handle on that. Oh, yeah. That was a real thing. <laughs> wow. That sounds amazing. That sounds sad. <laughs> it was scary. Wow. <laughs> that's what it was. I no. love, love, love it. That's it though. Yeah, they were. That's exactly it. That And that's how I looked at it. Did I have every answer? Absolutely not. But I was happy that they were that invested. And that made me go back to my team and say, hey, I've got to understand this in, in a deeper way. Yeah. Really interesting. Well, this has been part of an amazing collection of thought leaders. Um, and wow, Ariella, I have loved this. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we did say this is an eye, this could be an eye roll episode, but it has been <laughs> farthest from that. It's been really good. And, and I liked how you started us off that it is a complete mindset shift. And so thank you for that. This has been one of our nonprofit power week discussions. We only do this a couple times a year and uh, your part-time controller has joined us in this process. We've talked about technology as a financial tool. Who knew? We talked about preparing for the audit and how it reduces stress and it builds health within your organization. We talked about general financial best practices, and that was a fascinating conversation because it linked into so many other departments within a nonprofit. It wasn't just about the finance department. And then, of course, today, budgeting. Tomorrow's going to be really interesting. We're going to be talking about those questions that have come up, that's, it's our Ask and Answered episode. Um, there are questions that are standalone situations that have kind of bubbled up throughout this course of, of five shows, four shows. So um, it's going to be really a lot of fun, and I hope you can join us for that. If you've missed any of our live episodes, of course, join us on our archives. Ariella Reese, wow, I'm really glad that you are out there working with our nonprofit segment. Thank you. Julia, Absolutely. Wendy, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. You can find more about Ariella, manager, your part-time controller, and all the team man managers 
and leaders at your part-time controller. Find them on their website, yptc.com. They have tons of resources, videos, podcasts, white papers, a lot of information that they share. And it's really an, a fabulous thing to, to be able to access. Whether you're a client of theirs or not, it's not gated. You can get in there and really learn. Another thing that we learn from every day are our sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and of course, our friends over at Your Part-Time Controller. Ladies, this has been great. I've learned a lot. And Ariella, I think um, for me is that you've reduced some of that fear and unknown. You've made it more accessible. So thank you for that. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Wendy, again, my friend, thank you so much. And as we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we like to remind ourselves, our viewers, everyone out there to stay well so you can do well. Thank you, ladies.